wonderful to sing glories this morning, isn't it? Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Come, Devoted Father of mercy and grace, Thou art welcome in this place. Let's sing it again. this morning, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Oh, Father, of mercy and grace, Thou art welcome in this place. Let's make sure he's welcome. Prophet told us he keeps all of his appointments. He's been invited, but whether he's welcome or not depends on us. Amen. Let's make sure he's welcome. Amen. While we're standing, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation. And while you're turning there, I have an exciting announcement to make. You know, uh, Brother Ron and Sister Becky Garvin had a little baby girl Wednesday. Little Bronwyn Isabel Garvin, amen. Bronwyn means pure hearted. So we're so happy for them. May God bless them abundantly. Praise be to God. Also, another announcement today is mine and Angie's 23rd wedding anniversary. So thank God for that. Amen. Praise the Lord. So I've preached on my anniversary, I've preached on my birthday. I, Praise God. Amen. Also, I want to let you know that we'll be going away tomorrow, Angie and I, for a few days. We'll be back before the weekend, but Brother Kyle Weicker is going to take the Wednesday night service, and then Brother Ben Siebel is going to take the Sunday service. We'll be back for that service, but he's going to take it for me, and I appreciate them, brothers. Be praying for them. Also, remember Brother Ben in prayer because he's up in Michigan right now preaching for Brother Dan Ratliff, so remember him while we have our service here. Amen. God be praised. Let's look here at Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> the revelation of Jesus Christ. Stop. I don't want to read any more. I want to leave it with that impact. Well, we're, when you look into the book of Revelation, right in the beginning when you start, the declaration of what this is comes right up and hits you right in the face. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's turn over to Romans chapter 9. Now can you see why the book of Revelation is the bride's book? The capstone of the Bible. Amen. And God kept it hid behind symbols. Amen. So that nobody could interpret. They could try, but nobody with any authority could accurately interpret. Amen. Until a prophet would come along. And it was the right prophet at the right season to come and unlock the mysteries. So we catch the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, Romans chapter 9, verse 30. 9 and 30. What shall we say then that the Gentiles which follow not after righteousness have attained? 
to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, had not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Let's just bow our heads and pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to gather together to worship your name. And now as we come, Lord, to the preaching of the word, we do so because you told us to. We do so because you laid this pattern out, Lord. Lord, but there's no sufficiency in man. There's no ability in humans, Lord. So we look beyond that, Lord, and we come according to a promise in your word, trusting that you'll speak through human lips. Lord, when Israel was camped in the wilderness, you brought fresh manna day by day, they didn't have to labor for it or work for it. All they had to do was gather, Lord. And I pray that you would drop fresh manna from heaven now, Lord, that we could gather it and feast on it and enjoy it. We love you. and We pray you find preeminence in all that we say and do. And Lord, find a welcome in our hearts this morning. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You can all be seated. <clears throat> As we look here at Romans chapter 9, if you'll remember, when Brother Branham comes to Sirs, is this the time, uh, <clears throat> he's preaching this, this, he's had a series of six dreams that people have brought to him, and those six dreams are all talking in one way or another about him going out west or storing up food or, or things like that, and, and it's capped off by a vision, and, he, and he's get caught up in a constellation of angels, and now he knows he's got to leave and go out west to, to meet those angels for the revelation of the seven seals. And so when Brother Branham says when he has this vision, he said, the vision nearly packed me out of the room, and, and he found himself in the corner of the room reading this scripture. So this is a significant scripture. He's reading, as it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whosoever believes in him shall not be ashamed. And so now he's talking about seeing a constellation of angels, getting caught up in the constellation of angels, and now he knows he needs to go out west, and he's, he's asking, could this be that third pool? Is that them seven unknown thunders? Is it time for them thunders to be revealed, that the seals on the backside of the book, the part that not even written in the book? And he's asking this question, but... But supernaturally, when he gets caught up in this realm, he's beside himself, and he comes to, and when he comes to, he's in the corner of his room with his Bible open reading this scripture. Amen. Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone. I wonder what's coming. Amen. It's the coming of the stumbling stone. Amen. What was a cornerstone now coming to be the head of the corner, and it's going to be a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. And whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. Whosoever believeth in him has nothing to worry about, has no shame, has no iniquity, amen, has no sin, but will be completely purged by what? By believing and receiving the stumbling stone. Let's back up and just read this section again so we can catch context. It says, what shall we say then that the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, hath attained to righteousness, even the righteousness was of faith? He's showing this principle now, the contrast between the Jews, the old church, and the Gentiles. The old church, amen, they had received the prophecy, they had received the written word, but when the living word come, they didn't have any faith and couldn't believe in that. It became a rock of offense and a stumbling stone to them, amen, but the Gentiles would receive it by faith, and now they They've received the law of righteousness by faith, and those that were striving after righteousness have failed in righteousness because they didn't believe the stumbling stone. And now we come to the same place, Brother Brandon brings to the same place at the end of the church ages, at the end of the old church, they had received prophecy, they had received words, they had received the Bible, amen, but when the word came manifest in the flesh, it became a stumbling stone to them, a rock of offense and they stumbled at it, amen, but there's, go, there's going to be a Gentile bride, amen, was not going to stumble at the stumbling stone, but she would receive it for what it was, the seventh seal, the coming of the Lord, the mighty God unveiled, the mighty angel descending, and to her, she doesn't need to be ashamed anymore, amen, because there's no iniquity, there's no, now there's nothing but righteousness by what? By faith. 
not by works. The Gentiles received it by righteousness, which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, have not obtained to the law of righteousness. They wanted to be right, and they were wrong. The denominations through the systems have wanted to be right, but they become wrong. Amen. What made them go for what they, they desired the law of righteousness. They desired the word to make them righteous. Amen. But the only way that you can be righteous is by imputation, by faith. And so you cannot believe in the word. You have to believe the word. There's a big difference. You cannot believe in God. Amen. Devils believe in God, but it's not believing in God. It's believing God. Not believing in the word, but believing the word. And whenever the word comes, in whatever form the word comes in, then we believe that, and that's an imputation uh, of righteousness by faith. Amen. Why? Because it always comes as a stumbling stone. Micaiah was a stumbling stone to Ahab. You know, Noah and his ark was a stumbling stone to that scientific generation. Every time the word comes, it's a stumbling stone. They stumbled at it and wanted righteousness, but fell from righteousness. They haven't even attained to the law of righteousness because they, they could not receive the stumbling stone when it was presented to them. Let's not stumble at the stumbling stone. Let's turn to Matthew 21. If I can today, I, I, I want to minister on the stone cut out of the mountain without hands. Spend a little bit of time on this. I'm trying to teach myself to go slow. You know how self-reformation works. It usually ends in disaster. So we're just gonna trust God to do whatever he wants to do, but I don't wanna go so fast and cram so much in that we leave not knowing where we're at. I just want God to just have his way and I wanna just relax now. Relax in his presence and let him have his way. Matthew 21, verse 42. Jesus said unto them, did, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but... On whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. This is an <clears throat> interesting portion of Scripture that, that there's a stone that the builders have rejected that will become the head of the corner. It's the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. And he says, now the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth fruits. So the kingdom of God is going to be taken away from the Jews and given to another nation. But we know it was never given to one nation. There's no, you can't say that it went to the Greeks or it went to the Romans or it went here. Amen. But, but it was taken away. The kingdom of God was taken away. And it was given into another people. And that other people became the kingdom of God. And then he says, and whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. This stone, we know a stone is a revelation in the word of God. And whoever so ever falls on this stone will be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. So we find that no matter who you are, no matter what you think, you will come in contact with this stone. And when you come in contact with this stone, It'll, require, it'll, it'll bring brokenness. And the question is whether it's voluntary or involuntary, but you will come in contact with this stone. At some point, everyone will come in contact with this stone that was rejected, that's become the head of the corner. And when you come in contact with that by free will and throw yourself upon the stone, you're broken, amen, broken from wrong ideas, broken from a false life, broken from hybridization, broken from sin, amen, so that he can put you back together the way that he wants. But if you refuse that brokenness, at some point, that stone that you refused will be the stone that crushes you and grinds you into powder and blows you into the chaff of the wind. So there's no option on coming in contact with this stone, which is a revelation of the word. 
and this stone, you will either be broken on it or you will be broken under it. One will be voluntary when you come in contact and are not ashamed and throw yourself down on the revelation of the word for your day. Or you can reject it, amen, and you can, you can, you can stumble at the stumbling stone and reject it, but there's going to come a day when you do that that you will be ashamed when you stand before God and that stone will crush you. Oh, praise God. I say, Lord, let me fall on that stone fresh every day and be broken from ideas, be broken from concepts, be broken from intellect, be broken from passions, be broken from everything that's human. Amen. And be like you. Let's look at Luke 17 together. Luke 17 and verse 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So now the Jews were going to lose the kingdom and it was going to go to another nation. But Jesus says that the kingdom of God doesn't come with observation. You can't say it's over there and it's over there and it's over there for the kingdom of God is within you. So now we know where the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is inside a people on the earth. The Jews were the oracles of God. They were keeping the word of God. They were, they, were, they were keeping the light shining of the word of God. Amen. But when the true light came, they refused it to keep their artificial light or keep, keep the portion of light. They refused the fullness of light. Amen. And now that, that kingdom was removed from them and given to another nation that will bring forth fruits thereof. And that other nation, amen, is not a country or a physical location or something with borders that you can measure out because the kingdom of God doesn't come with observation. You can't say over there there's a 10-mile square, or there's a continent, or there's a... That kingdom now is within you. Praise God. Now, let's, I just want to lay those scriptures down for a foundation and then move forward. I want to, if we can bring up the PowerPoint, I want to look at a couple of uh, uh, quotes just as review from where we've been and move on from there. So now any Bible reader here knows that a scripture has a compound meaning, every prophecy, some most all of it is a dual, a time there, or two times or more that will be answered as a revolving history. Now as I said last night, and we all know that every prophecy is a compound meaning, compound, it repeats itself. Praise God. And he says, and how many knows that scripture is a compound meaning to every prophecy? Sure does, yes sir. It'll say it and mean it just exactly to this time and turn right around and repeat it again back over here somewhere. So when it's spoken, it means, like when David was speaking of his condition in the Psalms and crying out, it was a real condition he was going through right then, something that was happening to him, but he was also referring to something that would happen, amen, when Christ was in Calvary. And it had a dual meaning. And then he says, now, this prophecy, of course, like all other prophecy, is a compound meaning. A prophecy sometimes has a natural meaning, then it has a spiritual meaning. So it, it's interesting that Brother Branham can come to this and he can begin to show you that there's a, there's a revolving history to the Word of God. We find it repeating itself. I mean, you find it, you know, through the Old Testament, many times the cycle repeats over and over again, that they, 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 they God rescues them, they settle down under the rescuing power of God, he sends a prophet, he sends a judge, amen, and, and, the, and the, then they'll settle down, they'll turn back to Jehovah, but then they relax and little things start creeping in and they get caught up in adultery again and then he brings a warning and they don't heed the warning then comes another judgment through either a, a plague or, or another army coming in and then they cry out and after they cry out he brings a deliverer and the deliverer brings a deliverance and it goes and the cycle repeats because the prophecy repeats in a revolving history 
Sometimes there's a natural meaning, sometimes a spiritual meaning. That's why when God gave us the word, amen, he gave us his thought, amen. When God laid his thought down, he laid it in the word, but he wrote his word in such a way that the word is eternal and not limited by our carnal understanding. So the word of God is limitless. Let's just say it's limitless, amen, and that's why the word can only be known by revelation because by intellect we'll put boundaries on scriptures and when we put boundaries on scriptures, all of a sudden the very thing that'll bring us deliverance and understanding where we're at, we've pigeonholed to another place and now we walk in darkness because the light that he's gave us has been put out by our own intellectual understanding. And this word is a light. It's a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. And God sent it as a light, and it's a living word. It's not a dead word. I mean, the Old Testament is not history. The Old Testament's very much alive, amen? Everything that happened there and all the spirits, that, all the warfare, all the spirits, everything that was there is here. So it's very much alive, it's very much applicable, it's very much pertinent to what we're going through today because the same spirits they were fighting there are the same spirits you and I are fighting here. So we, we, we spied ourselves, we, we cut ourselves off, amen, from the very source that God gave us to overcome when we don't allow what Brother Branham taught us in the scriptures, when we don't allow that scripture to unfold through natural and spiritual, sometimes dual meanings, two or more meanings, and a revolving history, sometimes natural, sometimes spiritual. So we've got to break ourselves away from pigeonholing the word of God. We have to break our, really what we gotta break ourselves away from is the denominational approach to the word. And it's more pervasive than we think. We do it all the time and we don't mean to, but it happens to us all the time. But thank God he sent a prophet. Now I wanna to turn to the book of Daniel. Let's read Daniel together, Daniel chapter two. This is where we get the context where we drew our text out of for some of what we want to speak on. Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest me hold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image, image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, and the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. What's that? That's what the stone fell on. And what the stone fell on was ground to powder. It became like chaff in the summer threshing floor, and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beast of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given unto thine hand and hath made thee ruler over all them. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee and another third kingdom of brass which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these, shall it breaketh in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, and the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, 
and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and shall stand forever. So as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. So we know by, by the teaching that we've had and by the, what the prophet has taught us that there's an image that Nebuchadnezzar sees in a dream and that image starts with his kingdom and moves down through four kingdoms all the way down in the, where it's iron mixed with clay into the feet and then to the toes. And Brother Ram teaches us this is a Gentile world domination. This is the Gentile world powers, amen, moving down through, starting with Nebuchadnezzar who became unto the Lord as a king of kings. And so then he sees this image and a stone cut out of the mountain without hands. Now, you see where I picked the stone? That was just me, I just picked that. Why do you think I picked that stone? (laughs) Amen. Because of the message, because of everything else Brother Branham told us. Amen. And if if you, if you, if you, if you would ask me, Brother Chad, would you please go tell me where Brother Branham said that stone that was cut in the vision of Daniel was the pyramid capstone at the top of the pyramid? I'll just ask you to go read the message. Just go read the message, amen? Because it's the coming of the headstone, friends. It's the coming of the capstone, capping things off. And now there's a stone cut out of the mountain without hands, and it smites the image in the feet, and it crumbles, and then this stone grows into a a, a kingdom that fills all the earth. Are we together? So we, we definitely know he's not talking about rocks. Not talking about a mountain. He's talking about a kingdom, amen, and there's coming of a king, which is the stone cut out of the mountain without hands, and when the king comes, the king smites this image. Now, if if you look, this is the world domination of the Gentiles, which really is the manifestation of the kingdom of Satan. So really, we're looking at the manifestation of the kingdom of Satan, amen, that's going to dominate and rule the world until there's a coming of a stone, a king stone, the headstone, the capstone is going to come and smite this image in the feet. Why does it smite it in the feet? Because it's got to smite it in the place where the stone comes to manifestation, and the stone comes to manifestation at the end of these four stages all the way down when the Gentile kingdoms come to the end of time, the end of time for the Gentile domination, amen, at the toes, the stone has to hit it there, but when it hits the stone, when the stone hits the feet, it grinds the powder, the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold. It doesn't have to hit it in the head because that was Nebuchadnezzar's reign. And that same spirit, that, that antichrist spirit, Satan's kingdom, has now moved into the toes. So when the smiting stone comes, which is the king, the king comes and smites it in the feet, amen, and it grows into another kingdom. Praise be to God. The things that we have been told, the things that we have been shown, friends, the whole world is waiting for this to happen. And that doesn't mean that there won't come a king in the millennium as the son of David that will put down all other kingdoms and then that kingdom will grow to a giant mountain that fills all the earth. It will. It absolutely will happen literally on this earth in the millennium. But that doesn't mean that it's not happened already and happening now. And it won't happen again. See, if you think about this, when you talk about New Jerusalem, if we just, can, just for a minute, just bear with me and let me take my time and just, just relax. I'm just going to relax and not feel pressured. But there is a spiritual New Jerusalem on earth now, and that is the bride. And the bride has been adorned, prepared for her husband, and adorned in what? Adorned in the word. The revealed word of the last day has become her adornment, and she has made herself ready by putting this adornment on. 
and there's a, there's a new Jerusalem. But we see that there's going to come a destruction, at least a partial destruction to Jerusalem and Armageddon, amen, and then the, the king is going to come, which is gonna be Christ as the son of David, and we will come with him and establish a kingdom upon the earth. And that kingdom will be the kingdom of Jesus Christ as the son of David for a thousand years, and he will rebuild Jerusalem so you will have a new Jerusalem. So you have a new Jerusalem and a new Jerusalem. Are they both new Jerusalem? Yes. Then at the end of the millennium, there's going to be a holy fire from God come down and utterly destroy absolutely everything. Amen. And there's going to be a mountain rise up out of the earth, and that mountain will rise up out of the earth, and there's going to be a heavenly city, the heavenly Jerusalem, descend from God out of heaven. Amen. After the millennium, when we move into eternity, it will come down and it will cap off or rest over top of this mountain, and the city will be on the mountain, and this will come down over the mountain and it'll be New Jerusalem. So which one's New Jerusalem? It's all New Jerusalem. It's all telling the same story. It's all telling the same thing. Man, you have, a, you have it spiritually now. You have it naturally in the millennium. And then when you move beyond the millennium and the new heaven and the new earth, what was spiritual and what was natural blends together and now there's no veil separating heaven and earth. There's nothing separating the dimensions anymore. What was spiritual and what is natural now blends together for eternity upon this earth. Amen. And there's no separation from heaven and earth. So you have spiritual, natural, and the blending of spiritual and natural. You got that? So we have to know who we are and where we're at because I'm, I'm not a Jew. I'm not a Jew. So I don't need to see something physical. I'm a Gentile been called under the spiritual reality of a kingdom being taken away from a group of people in a physical location and given to another nation, which the kingdom of heaven is within you, which is no longer a geographical location, but inside a people on the earth. So the kingdom moved from a location with a headquarters called Jerusalem, now moved into another place, which is his people. And so the Gentiles are able to catch this concept of what was natural to Israel is now spiritual to the Gentiles. And we need to get comfortable with that because if we get comfortable with that, we'll know where we're at and what's going on right now. Because I'll tell you, New Jerusalem is here. There's a kingdom that has grown and is covering the face of the earth. There is a light that is shining. Amen. The light has descended. The king has come. The king and queen have united. He's sitting on the throne at the top of the mountain. And I cannot give you the physical dimensions because there's not physical dimensions. It's a spiritual happening that's taking place right now. Praise be to God. And if we can get comfortable with that, we can get the benefit from that. Because the benefit of not always putting off, putting off, putting off, waiting, 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 it puts us in a stagnant, stalemate position where we begin to slumber and fall asleep again and fall back into the same category of denominationalism. And constantly pushing something down the road is going to bring the denominational spirit right back in and we're gonna lose our youth and we're gonna fall asleep again. But this isn't something for the future. This is something for right now that's happening right now. And we need to ask God to rub the eye salve in our eyes fresh every day so that we can see what's going on all around us. Because in our hearts, maybe not in our intellect, but in our hearts, he has ripped the veil separating heaven and earth. Amen. And it's com connected in my soul. And that's the reality that's within the believers. Praise the Lord. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It is a foundational scripture for us. 
in more ways than one. Brother Bram says, now, if you notice in the scripture reading there in the Psalms, I kept saying, God is my rock. Do you know what a rock represents in the Bible? A rock in the Bible here represents the revelation of God. See, God is my revelation. He is, see, the revelation of the word is the rock. So if a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, what is that? <laughs> Amen. 1962, Perseverant. But God's got a construction a constructed church that's built on the rock, Christ Jesus, and all other ground is sinking sand, said Eddie Perinette. That's right, upon this rock I'll build my church. The Catholic church said it was upon Peter. He backslid after that. The Protestants said it was upon Jesus. I differ with you. He said, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven, has revealed this to you. Then it was upon the rock of spiritual revelation of the word. That's right, same thing Abel had. So listen, I, let's just stop right here. Whatever Peter had is the same thing Abel had. But we're talking thousands of years apart in different parts of the scripture. One caught a revelation of the fall in the Garden of Eden and the need for a blood sacrifice. The other caught a revelation of Jesus Christ being the Son of God. And, and Brother Bram said, what they got was the exact same thing because they got the revelation of the word for their day. Oh, there's no way we can overemphasize that. I could repeat that 10 times in a sermon. We could go to prayer and we will be all right. Amen, because we've got, in order to come in contact with Jesus Christ, you must come in contact with the living word made flesh in your day. What Abel had was, and received was the same thing that Peter received. They received the word, the revelation of the word for their day, and it counted Abel as righteous and Peter as righteous. That's right. Same thing Abel had. It was revealed to him. Instead of offering fruit like Cain did, he offered blood, for it was revealed to him. The whole church of God is built upon the spiritual revelation of Christ who he is, what he is, and all about him. Amen. Praise be to God. We don't mean to be rude. There's no desire to be rude. But outside the revelation of the word for your day is no life. It's death. Outside the ark Everything died. The ark was the revelation of the manifestation of the revelation of the word for that day, and everything outside of that died. And that's everything outside of this message, unless you're part of the 144,000, is death. It doesn't mean there won't be those who are granted eternal life at the white throne judgment, but right now it's not eternal life for them. They'll be permitted to enter into eternal life, but right now it's not equal to eternal life. It's death. Everything outside is death. Remember, that judgment at the great white throat judgment is the judgment of the dead. Not the living. The only judgment the living have is a judgment of rewards. But that white throne judgment is a judgment of the death. All the dead rose. Praise be to God. And that's not in a way to be rude or say that there's categories for everybody. God knows. There's those who's going to receive entrance into eternal life. There's those that will be there and come into the city and visit you, and you'll like it. And you'll be happy. So it's not cutting everybody out. It's not that. But we have to recognize the word. We have to recognize what the word means. It's not flexible to our ideas. It doesn't make us feel warm, fuzzy, and comfortable all the time. Amen. The word is the word, and the word doesn't flex, and the word doesn't move. That ark was non-negotiable. It was non-negotiable. You're either in the ark or you're out of the ark. In the ark you live, out of the ark you die. It's non-negotiable. And now the message is Christ. You're either in Christ or out of Christ. It's not negotiable. And we can't be in Christ, amen, by refusing the light of the hour and trying to walk in the light from a previous hour that, that the only way you can enter into Christ is to find him present tense and enter him there. 
And if you enter him there, Christ is the full revelation of the full word of God. So if you enter at the entry point, which is the word made manifest in your day, when you enter in, you get all the word. But you gotta find the door, you gotta find the gate, you gotta find the way to enter, and that's through the word made flesh in your day. Praise God. But Abraham says, that's what Paul was. No matter how much intellectual he had learned, he had known God by revelation. Yes, sir, the intellectual went all the way out of the business then. When the revelation came, which upon the rock the church is built, Yes, sir, notice, he was a predestinated seed. The Holy Ghost alone shows you who he is. There is no man. They'll make, they'll make you Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and everything else out of it, see? But the Holy Ghost will reveal him as the Lord God of heaven made manifest. That that is him. What will the Holy Ghost do? The Holy Ghost will reveal to you the Lord God of heaven made manifest that that is him. So the Holy Ghost will not point you back to a previous age. That's not the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost will point you to the Lord God of heaven made manifest. Praise God. Now, oh, praise be to God. Where do we want to go? All right, let's look at here. We've talked about this several weeks back. We've been talking about it quite a bit. But Brother Branham pointed in 1960 to an event that took place where they had the 10-nation committee on disarmament and the talks fell apart and, and uh, ended badly. But Brother Branham draws our attention to this and shows us that there was a divide of the eastern countries and the western countries, and there was five countries on each one, and he said the two big toes on those countries were the two leaders of the two big nations, and that was the United States and the Soviet Union, amen? And those two big toes were Eisenhower and Khrushchev. Eisenhower means iron, Khrushchev means clay. And so Brother Branham is trying to, uh, not trying, he's, he's looking at an event that's taking place in the world and he's, and he's drawing our attention to that because God drew his attention to that to show us where we are in the sequence of events, where we are in time for the Gentiles. And Brother Branham says, now, and did you notice right now at the last hour when we brought in and where that, this last great conference where Khrushchev with five nations of the East, Eisenhower the leader, five nations of the West, represented the ten toes of the image, they would not mix and Khrushchev took off his shoe and beat it. Spiritual mind would pick that up right quick. Without Brother Branham out, I missed it. So you have to figure out where your spiritual mind comes from. <laughs> Amen. We needed a prophet, friends. We had to have God show us. Spiritual mind would pick that up right quick. On the desk, they beat it on the desk. They will not mix. Next thing is the coming of the stone that chewed out of the mountain without hands that'll roll into the Gentile kingdom. It'll be finished. And just before that time, he's going to send his angel to what church? To Sodom? No. To the lukewarm? No. He sent it to the elected, called out church. What kind of a sign did he show? The same thing that he did here last night. God, Elohim, manifested in the person of the Holy Ghost in his church. Oh my, why it ought to send us a million miles in the sky with shouts and praises of his glory. Brother Ram is pointing that out, and he's saying the next thing to come is a stone that'll come and smite those nations in the feet. That's the next thing to come. But just before that, he'll send a messenger to the elect group. And he said, what sign will he show? Did you catch it? He says, what, what kind of sign did he show? The same thing that he did here last night. The same thing he did here last night when he turned his back to the tent and told what was Sarah was thinking in her heart. Amen. And Brother Branham is there manifesting the same sign, showing that the same one is present. Amen. Giving a message to his elect. Amen. Just before the stone comes down and smites the image in the feet. Now, we got the image down to the feet, down to the toes. And we've got the one who's going to come first 
with a ministry to the elect doing the same signs. Everything's in place. Now it's time for the stone to come. And here we are in 1960, amen? Praise be to God. That means, amen, if, if, if Brother Branham's talking here and he's showing we've come to the end of the feet, to the end of, amen, this manifestation of the Antichrist spirit down through the Gentile world powers, we've come to the end of that and now the Elohim is here in human flesh again doing the same sign that he did there just before the destruction of Sodom, amen. Then all of a sudden you have to look around and say, Where's the stone? Where's the stone? Where's the stone? It's time for the stone. Everything's in place. Praise God. Amen. So that stone, when it's cut out, it smashes that image in the feet. Now, Brother Branham, he, he explains uh, this image, and he shows the domination of the world powers from Babylon to the Medes and Persians to the Empire of Greece to Rome, and Rome goes all the way out into the end. And it turned from pagan, uh, pagan Rome to papal Rome, and then it was a religion that was mixed in, mingling with pol the po politics, religion and politics now mixing in and infiltrating into everything. Said, Brother, I said, it's Rome. It's always Rome. It'll always be Rome. It's Rome. And Rome has mingled itself in. And there's several places in the message where Brother Bram talks as iron and clay, and he starts showing it Protestants and Catholics. And he said they start to, to mix together, but they won't mix together, but they're starting to come together to mix together, but they won't completely mix. Is that right? And he's showing the ecumenical move where they're coming in, where the World Council of Churches is starting up, and the, uh, the evangelicals and the Protestants are gathering together, the Catholics are gathering together, they're going to make a pack and come together to try to mix, but they won't completely mix. So Brother Ben, he's showing us that this image coming down to the feet, it's both a political and a spiritual power. It's both political and spiritual. There'll be a destruction of all the political powers and the kings. Absolutely, don't worry. But before that, he's going to destroy the stronghold of the spiritual and set his children free. So he's gonna, there's going to be a spiritual stone cut out of the mountain that's going to strike, amen, this image at the feet and break the power, amen, of this Catholicism and Protestantism, the power of the whore and the harlots. The seducing spirit of Jezebel, amen, that has seduced God's children. He's going to break that power with a revelation, a stone that's going to smite the image in the feet, and then that's going to grow into a, a kingdom that's going to fill all the earth. And then there will be the son of David that will put down all other nations and build a mountain, which is a kingdom that will fill all the earth. See, mountains are kingdoms many times in the Bible. And it's amazing that uh, Moses was called into a mountain. And when he's called into the mountain, he met the pillar of fire, where? In the mountain, Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai. When he got the word, amen, the covenant word for the people of Israel, he got it on the mountain. So God will bring a servant to the top of the mountain, and at the top of the mountain, he'll give them the word, amen, that's a covenant between him and his people. And we know that, that that went wrong, the people refused it, but there's always this, these mountaintops. And even God, when he's, when he's calling out, and Ezekiel calling out Lucifer, he says, you were on my holy mountain, amen, but I kicked you out of my mountain. That means he's been kicked out of the kingdom. And this mountain that grows in Daniel will be a kingdom. So many times the mountain is a kingdom. But let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. For ye are not come unto the mountain that might be touched, and that burneth with fire, nor into blackness and darkness and tempest. And the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice that they heard, entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it should be stoned or thrust through with a dart. 
And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But you are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that you refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that spoke on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Who voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. In this word, yet once more, signifying the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Now the apostle Paul brings us in the book of Hebrews, and he says, you've not come to the natural mountain where the law was given, where they met God and saw the pillar of fire come down on top of the mountain. You've not come to that mountain, but you've come to a mountain. Is that right? So now Paul is the one who is taking the natural things from the Old Testament and bringing them to become spiritual realities in the New Testament. So Paul will take what happened to Moses, amen, and he'll bring it right up here to today and say, you've not come to that mountain, but you've come to Mount Zion. And so now Moses brought them to a place, amen, and in that place they were supposed to, when they heard the trumpet sound, go up into the mountain and meet with God and hear his voice directly, but they refused and ran away. But Moses brought them to the meeting place, but they refused and they received the law, which was a covenant between God and his people. But now, now Paul the Apostle's coming along. There's three great prophets, amen, outside of Jesus Christ. Three great prophets that we want to take note of. Moses, the Apostle Paul, and Brother Branham. Three great prophets, and all of them have to do with a mountain and the word. Right? Moses brought a people freed from the bondage of Egypt, enslaved in Egypt, and brought a people out to meet God on their way to the promised land, and he was given the word. Paul was bringing a people out of the bondage of religion and trying to bring them to Mount Zion. He said, you've not come to that place, but I've brought you to a place. I've brought you to Mount Zion. What were they supposed to do at Sinai? When they heard the trumpet, they were supposed to go and meet God. Now Paul brings them to the base of Mount Sinai, amen, and he's bringing it to the base of Mount Sinai, but there's going to be a building up of Mount Zion, uh, Zion for three years or for some seven church ages. But when we get to the top, amen, something's going to happen at the top of Mount Zion that's going to be the king. The king's going to come, cap this mountain, and unite with his church. So Moses brought them to a mountain and gave them the word. Paul brought them to a mountain and gave them the word. And Brother Branham, amen, comes at the top of the mountain and receives the word. Amen. Moses wrote the Old Testament. Paul wrote the New Testament. And Brother Branham gave the revelation of the unwritten word in the top of the mountain. Amen. That reveals the mystery laying through Old and New Testament. Three great prophets, amen, and we happen to be living in the day, not of Mount Zion, not at the base, or not of Mount Sinai, not at the base of Mount Zion, but we through seven church ages worked our way up, and now we're up in the capstone in the throne with the king himself. This is a different age, and we, we need to act different, think different, believe different, be different, amen. We're not in the journey, we're in the top. And Paul was the one bringing the church to this mountain, and this mountain was spiritual. You know, the apostle Paul has absolutely no problem taking something from the Old Testament that's fixed and solid and tangible and touchable. And he'll bring it right to the New Testament church, and it's spiritual, nothing you can touch, lay your hands on. It's a faith in the word. 
Because that's the dispensation for the Gentiles. It's spiritual revelation, spiritual manifestation. A spiritual kingdom in you. It was taken away from the Jews, which was physical, and given to a nation, which is spiritual. What nation is that? The nation of the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God. Praise God. Now, now, the apostle Paul, he's coming at the end of the Old Testament, he's coming into the New Testament to lay out the New Testament, but he's speaking of a voice that'll speak from heaven, that'll shake. He said, that voice shook the earth, but don't refuse him that speaketh that is going to shake the heavens and the earth. So that anything that can shake, that can move, will be shaken, so that that which cannot move shall remain. So now he's talking about a voice from heaven that'll shake not just the earth, but the heaven and the earth. And, and remember, now Paul is talking spiritually. He said, you've come to the heavenly Jerusalem, you've come to the, uh, uh, you know, the, the spirits of just men made perfect. You've come to all of it. None of it you can see. None of it you can see. None of it you can feel with the senses. It's all spiritually discerned. So when the shaking comes that he's talking about, is he talking about something where you see, you know, all the, uh, all the stars falling as shooting stars to the earth and great earthquakes rumbling? That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a shaking that's going to shake the whole world. And when Brother Branham got caught up in the constellation, he said there was a blast that shook the whole earth. Shook the horse. Why? It shook every religious system. It shook every religious demon. Amen. It even shook. I'm telling you, it shook the powers in heaven because we war not against principalities and flesh and blood, but we war against uh, principalities and powers in heavenly places. That term actually means in heaven. Because the accuser of the brethren is there making accusation. He has access to the, the throne in heaven to accuse you. And when this blast went off, amen, for the opening of the seven thunders, it didn't just shake the religious system on earth, but I assure you, friends, it shook heaven itself. Heaven and earth has been shaken from this voice that has come from heaven. Where? At the top of Zion. All these things that Brother Brandon is teaching us and telling us, he's pulling them right out of the scriptures, friend, and making them alive. Amen. And we just have to take what he said. We've made so many mistakes as human beings trying to take the word and use the word to him in the message. Oh, if I could take time to explain this. We want to prove everything by the word, but we've had the backwards approach to proving everything by the word. So we've taken our understanding or denominational understanding through years of the word and we've tried to frame Brother Branham's message in our paradigm of the word. And because you can read the scriptures easy for water baptism in Jesus' name, it fit in. And you could read the scriptures on, there's only one God, only one Lord, and you could slip that in there too. And you could even read about uh, Eve was beguiled by the serpent. You could see serpent seed, and so you could slide that in right there. But there was some things he said that was so mysterious, amen, it was far beyond an intellect being able to read black marks on white paper. So we would leave that outside, saying that we're just judging this by the word and shaving off things that the prophet taught us. Is that the truth? That's exactly what's happened. Not by evil intentions, but the carnal mind through a denominational upbringing, trying to take the word and check the message with the word. And Brother Branham said, take everything I said back to the word. But Brother Branham wasn't saying he was teaching it wrong. He was letting you know, this is right. Take it to the word. You'll find it in the word. So now we've got to take the pattern that was laid out at the opening of the seals and lay that pattern down all through the word. And with that pattern in our minds, read the word. And all of a sudden, the word starts coming to life. We start seeing things that were there that we never knew were there. And all of a sudden, this is why he said this, and this is why he said that, and this is why he said that. 
Oh, praise be to God. Let the prophet be the prophet. Moses was the giver of the word, amen, in the Old Testament. Amen. Paul was the giver of the word in the New Testament. And Brother Branham was the revealer of the word at the end of it all. Let him have his job. He said, when all the mysteries of the Bible was all finished, down comes this angel. Who was finishing the mysteries? What ministry was that? The ministry of the seventh angel. That's his job. It wasn't never our job to fact check Brother Branham. It was Brother Branham's job to break our fact checker. <laughs> Amen. So that we can break the carnal, the intellectual, the ability to read. Oh, my goodness, we think it's such a privilege to be able to read. Amen. Those who would, would benefit from the prophecy laid out in the book of Revelation with those that read or hear. Amen. You don't even have to be able to read. Amen. Paul, Peter was not an intellectual man, and it benefited him well just to be able to receive the keys to the kingdom. So praise be to God. We don't want to get in bad habits. We want all bad habits to be broke. Let the prophet bring the word. That's what a prophet is, a divine revealer of the word. Brother Bram gave us that definition, a divine revealer of the word. And he says, and what we have now is the perfect interpretation of the word with divine vindication. So I'm not interested in fact-checking Brother Branham. I want him, I want that message that God brought through that vessel to break every notion and tear down every wall and fence. And I want to go back to the word with some freedom to move in the message. With some freedom to explore the land. With some freedom to cut away the ball and chain and cut away all the restrictions. Amen. And just be free to enjoy the word. Amen. So now the Apostle Paul uh, here in Hebrews, he's laying this out. You've come to a mountain. You've come to heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to an innumerable company of angels. He never said you're coming to. You've already come. Because why? That's all part of this mountain. That's all part of Mount Zion. It's all there. You've come to it. He says now, Verse 25, see that you refuse not him that speaketh, for they escape not who refused him that spake on earth. Much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifying the removing of those things which are shaken as the things which are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Apostle Paul says we're receiving a kingdom, and that kingdom cannot be moved. He says in the message in his presence from 1962, he said this is evangelism. This is the time to shake people. This is the time that... God said there'd come a time he shook Mount Sinai one time, but there'd come a shaking again. He wouldn't only shake Mount Sinai, but he would shake everything that could be moved. But did you notice the rest of the scripture? But we receive a kingdom that cannot be moved. Hallelujah. Everything that can be shook will be shaken. The heavens will shake. The earth will shake. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word shall never pass away. For upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. Everything that can be shook will be shaken, but we receiving a kingdom which is the word of God himself, and God is the word. So what is that kingdom? The word of God himself, and it cannot be shaken, and God is the word. He don't shake himself. Amen. But we receiving a kingdom that cannot be moved, it is unshakable, said Paul, the Hebrew writer. I want to read a couple more quotes on the same subject. And the world is falling apart. He says, we are dead. Our lives are hid in God through Christ. And not only that, but we are raised with him, raised up. Well, in a system, a denomination, organization, we are resurrected in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is within you. 
Why? All these man-made systems must fall. Not one, not once more I'll shake the world, but I'll shake heavens. And those things that cannot be shook, it's what will remain. And we receive a kingdom, receiving a kingdom that cannot be shook or moved. That's the kingdom of God. Not a system, not a political wheel, not a denomination, but a kingdom. Amen. And its subjects is dead to the systems of this world. Its subjects are dead to these organizations. It's dead to those political systems. And it's alive and resurrected by the power of the king. And future home. He says, and look, you are part of that ground. Is that right? And when he redeemed you, he redeemed the earth with the same thing. And you are together again. How much plainer can it be? You have to be redeemed because you're part of it. And if the blood didn't drop on you, you ain't redeemed yet, you're not called. Then he cleansed it. That's the same thing he does in the fire. Even the blood dropped. It's yet got to be cleansed by fire. That's right, for a dwelling place for God. God already took up his abode potentially. The kingdom of God is in the earth now in the hearts of his saints. Are you in a kingdom? Is the kingdom in you? What's the geographical location? I'll tell you where it is. It's covered the whole earth. It's his attributes that he began in the beginning. Now his attributes is redeemed. What's he waiting? To redeem the earth, to set his attributes on it, to fulfill exactly his predestinated plan. Then he says, Christ, and Christ is the mystery of God revealed. Then our headship is a kingdom. Amen. Oh, this is good. Our headship is a kingdom. What's our headship? The capstone. What's the capstone? Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ, the capstone, the headstone coming to the church is a kingdom. The kingdom of God is within you, said the Bible, Jesus, the kingdom. We are not a denomination, we belong to a kingdom and the kingdom is the word of God made spirit and life in our own life. Let's read that again, the kingdom, the kingdom is the word of God made spirit and life in our own life. That's the kingdom. Not just say, I've got the kingdom, I listen to the message. No, it's got to become spirit of life in our life. That's the kingdom. Become spirit of life in our own life. Every promise in this day as it did in the day when the word and God was one. And the word and God is one in this church today, making it the headship of the body that is redeemed to bring the message in the last day and be taken up from the dead in the resurrection, to go back and restore again as Adam and Eve in the beginning in the Garden of Eden, the threefold mystery of God, his body. The threefold mystery of God has to do with his body. Second fold is preeminence in his body, in his body kingdom, his kingdom in you, the kingdom in you, in the earth now. What earth? This earth. Let's look at this section again out of Daniel, Daniel 2 and 31. Thou sawest till a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the prophecy that we're dealing with now. Now, I want to look at Junior Jackson's dream, if I can. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my time and not blow, blow through this either. But I want to read out, a, is this the sign of the end, sir? I got several places I'm going to read, but we'll talk about this dream. So Brother Jackson dreamed a dream. He couldn't get away from it and was leaving his church and he just couldn't stand it. How long ago has it been, Brother Jackson? Brother Braxton says, February 61. He had the dream and he came to me and said, something is on my heart, I must tell you, Brother Branham. I said, go on, Brother Jackson. He said, I dreamed a dream and there it was. I just sat still and I listened and watched. Brother Branham's now seeing it. He's listening to Junior Jackson tell it, but he's watching the dream. And I watched, he said, I dreamed that there was a great big hill like out in the field where bluegrass or something was and said, up on top of this hill where the water had washed away the soil, there was a top rock up on top the hill like the top of the mountain. It was a rock, no grass. And where the water had washed down, it had cut some kind of readings on these stones. And you were standing there interpreting this reading on these stones. 
and said, all of us, and here's the way he put it, the brethren from Georgia and from all around, we were all standing together listening to you interpret that mysterious writing on those stones, that mountain. And said, then you picked up something like from the air, something like a wrecking bar, a crowbar, wasn't it, brother? Something like that, a wrecking bar, real sharp. And said, it, how you done it, I don't know. And said, you struck the top of the mountain, ripped it around, and lifted the cap of it off. It was in the shape of a pyramid, and you ripped the top of it off. Now, that was months and months and months before the pyramid message was preached. Beneath that was white stone granite, and you said the sun or the light has never shined on this before. Look in on this. Watch this. And that's right, because the formation of the world, the world was formed before there was light. We all know that. God moved upon the water. Then, the, then in the beginning, he spoke for light and natural down, down under there in the age that, that formation was, that light had never come upon that stone. And he said, look upon this. Light has never come upon it before. And then when all of them got up and I told them to watch that, and all of them come up and look in. But he said, while they were looking in, he looked out the corner of his eyes, I believe it was, and watched me. I slipped off to one side and started going towards the west, towards the setting of the sun, coming up a hill, going down a hill, coming up a hill, going down a hill, getting smaller and smaller, and went all the way out of sight. So Junior Jackson comes to Brother Ram with this dream. This is the first dream in a series of six dreams that individuals will bring to him that's capped off by the vision of the constellation of the seven angels. And in Sirs' this the time, he says there was this pyramid coming up out of the earth. Amen, friends. Where, where has this pyramid of the church ages come from? From the earth, the people, you, you and, and the people down through the ages for 2,000 years have been flesh, part of the earth, eating the earth, earth making their body, and in their body, amen, was a portion of the word for that age, amen, and that mountain has been growing out of the earth. Through the seven church ages, it's been coming up out of the earth. Brother Branham says, your bodies were laying in this earth back when he formed the foundation of the world. Your body laid right there. The materials for your body laid right there. So this great monument to God, this great pyramid that's been raising through seven church ages has been coming out of the earth. And up at the top, the washing of the water of the word is starting to reveal what's in the earth. Hallelujah, the prophet's been revealing the church ages. He's been revealing, amen, what has been coming up out of the earth from the time of Paul on. It's been building and building and building this great pyramid shape through seven dispensations of time coming up now to the top, to the cap. And he says up there was a top rock, like a pyramid at the top, amen. And there was where the water had washed down. The water, the word had washed down. He said it had cut, uh, it had cut writing in this rock. In another place, Brother Bibb says, funny looking writing. Funny writing, because nobody could interpret it. They, the, the, the Lutherans tried, and the Wesleyans tried, and, and the Pentecostals tried, but it was funny writing. And Brother Benham never attributed to any given language. Yeah, you understand? He didn't say it was this kind of writing or that kind of writing. He said funny writing. <laughs> because there's only one that's ever going to be able to interpret that writing, and it's going to be the seventh angel. That funny writing was put there just for him. And he says, all of a sudden, he reached out of the air, and he grabbed something like a wrecking bar crowbar real sharp. And he just, he said, he didn't even know how he did it, just grabbed it somehow and popped the top off of this, and underneath was white stone. So there was writing all over on the outside of the stone. The stone was coming up out of the earth. Oh, if we could just catch this, friends. This is going to explain our whole existence and the whole church ages and everything right here. Coming up out of the earth, amen, through this hill, coming up, what was in the earth, what was laying in the earth undiscovered, amen, it was the very mountain of God, the very kingdom of God, the very people of God, amen, God himself in a pyramid form coming up through seven church ages, amen, but at the top, the water of the word begins to wash it away so you can see what's been in the earth all the time. 
And we get to the top and now there's this funny writing and nobody can interpret, but Brother Branham starts to interpret the writing because Brother Branham has to go around all over this outside word, which is what's written in the Bible and restore all the truths that were lost and interpret the Bible. And when he gets the Bible all interpreted, ties together all these loose ends that was left off through the church ages. When he gets done with that at the top, now it's time to reveal that there's something inside this rock now that has no writing on it. Oh, praise be to God. You know Brother Bram didn't have this dream. Junior Jackson had the dream. So he's not taking, he's not just saying, this is what happened and this was, no. Somebody else had the dream and God was showing it through another vessel, showing exactly what's taking place. And so now, Brother Branham had come to the end of tying together all the loose ends. He had preached the, uh, uh, he preached the church ages, which contain in the church ages every major doctrine of the church. Is that what he said? Tied together all the loose ends, interpret the writing on the outside of the rock. But then when he gets to the top and all the brothers are standing around, he gets an instrument, he gets a tool, he gets something in his hand, and he uses that tool to pop the top off of the mountain to show that there's something else in here. There's something else inside here. Everybody else can see the funny writing (laughs) and try to interpret serpent seed and water bed. Is there three gods, one God? Amen, I don't understand the serpent seed thing. What about election, election and free choice and how does election and free choice work? And Funny writing and everybody could try but there was one who could interpret the writing on that and that was Brother Branham. And when he got done tying together all the loose ends, something from heaven was given to him, an ability was handed to him to discover, amen, to pop the top off of this and discover that underneath the top of this, there is unwritten word. Light has never shined on this before. Nobody's even tried to interpret the funny writing. Why? Because there is no writing. And Brother Bram goes right to the seals. Let's, let, let's turn over here to Revelation. Revelation chapter 8. Oh, I'm trying to hold myself back. I, and, and so many of you are so well versed in this, you know exactly where I'm going, you know what I'm gonna say, but I just feel compelled to keep going through because sometimes you don't catch it the first time, second time, third time, but there's always a time when all of a sudden under the anointed preaching, he's like, got it, click. Something just clicked like never before. So I wanna take my time and go through this. Revelation 8, chapter, or chapter 8, verse one. See, that's what happens when I start talking too fast. Sends you to the wrong chapter, the wrong book in the Bible. We're going to, this is the opening of the seventh seal. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. See, Brother Brennan takes that and he shows that nothing said. Right here in the seventh seal, all other six seals, they had information, they had information, they had information. But when you get to the seventh seal, The only information that you have is silence about the space of half hour, nothing. But then he comes over here to Revelation chapter 10. We'll pick it up in verse one. He says, and I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head and his face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, seven thunders uttered their voices. That wasn't a rolling of thunder. A thunder in the Bible is always the voice of God. What the prophet tells us, and you can see it in the scriptures. Seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. So when the thunders uttered their voices, it spoke something that John could write down. So it wasn't just a noise, it wasn't an undiscernible noise, it was something that John heard and John comprehended, John understood, and John could record it. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. 
And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven and swore by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God, the mystery of God. And I just want to inject this. Christ is the mystery of God revealed. The one singular mystery with a threefold purpose. <laughs> Male, female, restored back to the Garden of Eden. The mystery of God. What is the mystery of God? Christ is the mystery of God. What is Christ? The anointed word in each age. The word in manifestation or the word becoming flesh. What is Christ? What is Christ the mystery of God revealed? I don't know about you, but to me, Christ the mystery of God revealed is the mystery that God wanted to be manifest in flesh. Jesus is flesh and my flesh. And I hope your flesh. Mystery of God. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So Brother Ben said when he begins to sound, he said not when he goes out and, and the, the healing campaigns and all of that. When he begins to sound out his message, and his message is the message of the seventh seal. He's the messenger of the seventh seal. And the seventh seal is Revelation 10, 1 to 7. That's what he says. And what, I, what, what is the message in Revelation 10, 1 to 7? It's the message that John was forbidden to write. Brother Branham, so Brother Branham says, that's why when he looks at this, he says there's seven thunders and those seven thunders are sealed. He says, seal it up and write it not. And that's why Brother Branham starts saying, see, there's seven, seven seals on the back part of the book. This is what he's talking about. Not 14 seals. There are no 14 seals. But he says there's seven seals, amen, in the book, and there's seven seals on the back side of the book, amen. And he's talking about the seven seals from Revelation chapter 6, the six seals, and then the seventh in Revelation chapter 8, amen, that come forth in symbol form, except the seventh, which is just silence for the space of half an hour. But then over here, you have seven thunders, seven voices, seven revelations, seven something that came from God when the angel descended. So when the angel comes to earth with an open book in his hand, then there are seven voices that bring information that John could write down, but he was told not to write it, to seal it. And Brother Branham calls those the seals on the backside of the book or the second set of seals. And so he sees the ones on the inside are open, but they're open in symbol form. But the ones on the backside, nothing's even spoke of them at all. And that's what he's referring to when he gets here to serves as this the time. And he takes that tool and he pops the top off and sees, he says, see, no light is shown on this unwritten word. It's not even written in the Bible. Why? Because when you come to the seventh seal, silence. When you come over here to the seven thunders, silence. He said, see, they're connected together. It's the same thing. Whatever the seventh seal is, amen, is what those seven thunders are. And he says, and Brother Brown says, I've read lots of men's writing, and I've never read where anybody ever said that there's seven seals yet to be revealed. Why? Because he's the one that was given the tool that'll pop open the top of this word. What's the... What's the top of the word? Amen, the word has been building Old Testament, New Testament, building all the way up. But you get to the top of the word or the capstone of the Bible is which book of the Bible? The book of Revelation. Amen. Brother Benham starts down through that book, down through the church ages. Amen. And he gets to a place now where serves as this the time. He starts showing that there's seals over here. There's a seventh seal here. There's thunders over here. What's he doing? He's interpreting the funny writing on the outside of the cap. But he says, but look, he grabs a tool, he pops it open and says, look, but there's something inside that's not even written in the Bible, amen. And he said, I went out west, and he said, maybe to get the interpretation of what that was. Oh, I love this. He said, 
And further, and sir, is this the time? Or is this the sign of the end, sir? And seven thunders right in the revelation here of Jesus Christ. It's some mystery. Does not the Bible say that the revelation of Jesus Christ? What is the revelation of Jesus Christ? This book that we're reading out of, the capstone book of the Bible, is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And there's a hidden mystery in the revelation of Jesus Christ that has to do with the white stone, the seven thunders, the unwritten portion in the word. Why? He said, why there is some hidden mystery then of it? <clears throat> what is it? The seven thunders have it. For John was just about to write, and the voice came down to heaven and said, don't write it, but seal it. Seal it up. Put it on the back side of the book. It's got to be revealed. It's the mysteries. Further down, he says, and notice, he said, in some mysterious way, we picked up out of the air a sharp tool that opened up the top, and in there was white granite, but it wasn't interpreted. There was no letters. I didn't interpret that, Junior. I just looked at it, and I said to the brethren, look on this, and that's fulfilled tonight. Brother Bam's coming down. He's taking this dream. He's taking all of this, and he's starting to piece it together so we know where we're at. And, he's, and Brother Benham said, now we went around, and we interpreted the writing on the wall, on, on the outside of the stone, and at the top. And, then, and what's he doing? Brother Branham is showing seven thunders, seven mysterious thunders, a seven seal silent, a seven thunder sealed up, don't write it, all of these things. And at the time of the, uh, the seventh angel's ministry, amen, the mystery of God will be complete. He's talking about all of that, what's he doing? He's taking the sharp tool and he's popping the top off of the word right there in the message serves his time and showing there's a white stone underneath. And Junior Jackson dreamed about it in February of 1961. And Brother Branham comes and says, that dream's fulfilled tonight. And he said, look on this and I'm going out west to get the interpretation and come back and we're gonna reveal what's not written. Amen. See, Brother Ben said, I used to think that it was something that was not even written in the Bible at all, but he said, see, you can't add one word or take one word away. It's something that has to be laying in the Bible but been missed back there. So what's he saying? That there is a white stone. There, so there's a, there's a, there's, out of the earth has been coming the kingdom of God. One delegate at a time. Building, building, building. What? His temple, his holy mountain, his dwelling place. Do we understand? We start thinking about temple when we think of Solomon's temple. We think of the temple in new heavens and new earth. Those are all symbolic friends. Where's his altar? Your heart. Where's his temple? You. Solomon gathered stones from all over, misshaped, different sized stones, and he fit them together perfectly to make his temple. Why? Because it's the living stones where the Shekinah glory of God abides. Oh, Brother Bram keeps pointing to the pyramid, to the pyramid, over and over, pointing to the pyramid. And the pyramid is made by all kinds of different size and shaped stones. Amen. And they've been gathered together and placed so perfectly in their position that they're earthquake proof. Everything that can be shaken shall be shaken, so that which cannot be shaken, which was the word that looked like a misfit to the world, but there was a place in the temple of God that you, that stone, fit perfect. And when you find your position and your place in the temple of God, the house of God, the mountain of God, the dwelling place of God, then you become earthquake proof. You cannot be shaken because you're the word. You're the living stone shaped by the word, put in position by the word in the temple of God, and it's become earthquake proof. Out of this, out of the earth comes the temple of God, the mountain of God. What is it? The kingdom of God, the holy mountain. Where is it coming from? You and me and great-great-grandma so-and-so and Luther's great-great-grandma so-and-so. What is it? Out of the earth is coming the holy mountain of God. And at the top, under the washing of the water of the word, there's revealing mysteries, loose ends in the Bible 
It was all tangled up, and there's going to be a prophet start interpreting that. And then when he gets to the top, and it's funny writing, he's going to begin to show that there's something more. There's something in the Bible. There's seven thunders. There's silence in heaven. There's something going on, a, a, a mighty angel descending, and, and a ministry of the seventh angel. And he takes a tool, and he pops it off, and he says, see, nothing was written, but it was sounded. It was the voice of God. And Brother Ben said, God doesn't do something just to be playing. God doesn't speak just to speak. He wasted, he just wastes not his breath. If God spoke, it was for a reason. And if God spoke, he gave a revelation. And if that revelation was sealed up, there has to come a time for that revelation to be unsealed. And Brother Brenham said that he showed us that that white stone is a mystery that's not written, but it's in the word. It's in the stone. I say it like this, it's in the living stones. What are you doing as a stone hewed out of the earth? All you see is stone. But I'd like to tell you behind the stone is a white rock. A mystery that's been going on through the whole Bible. And that mystery is a mystery of marriage, a mystery of a husband and a wife, a mystery of God becoming flesh. And that white stone is the unspoken mystery through the whole Bible. He said it was Christ and Noah. It was Christ and Moses. It was Christ and David. It was Christ. What was that? It was the white stone in the stone. Amen. It was Christ hiding behind Moses. It was Christ hiding behind David. It was Christ hiding behind Solomon. What was it? It was the white stone within the stone, amen, the unwritten portion of the Bible, the mystery of God becoming flesh. And nobody knew it till somebody could pop the top off and say there's more than what the theologians have been reading. There's more than what the, the printer can put in the book. There's more. What's laying there is written between the lines. It can't be a new word because you can't add to or take away. But this white stone, nothing's written because it's been written on the outside. But the revelation of the white stone will read between the lines on what's written on the outside and show you what the mystery has been through the whole book. Where at the top, when somebody can take a tool from God and pop the top off and say, there's a white stone inside. <laughs> oh, praise God. Where does that put us, friends? I hope you're not waiting for something to happen. You are the something that's happening. And I say that over and over, but I want it to sink into all of our hearts. I want it to sink into my heart. I want to repeat it till it becomes such a living reality it affects every moment of my day. Because it still hasn't hit like it should hit. We'll go over these things and go over these things and go over things because there's got to come a greater manifestation to what is going on. There's got to become a greater reality that's going on. There's got to be, oh, praise God, there's got to be that prophet with that tool in his hand that can cut away the casing stone off of me so the white stone can shine forth in my life. So it wouldn't be Chad Lamb, it would be Jesus Christ, the one on the inside. It was Christ in Moses, it was Christ in David, it's Christ in his bride. Can you say it's Christ in Bob, it is Christ in Chad, and it's Christ in Dave? Can you say that? And say, Lord, let that prophet take that tool and cut away the casing so that the whiteness comes through, the purity of the revelation of what's going on in this day. Hallelujah. Let's look in the book of Exodus real quick. I told you there's three prophets you have to watch. Moses, Brother Paul, Brother Branham. There's three Exodus, all tied to these three prophets. Let's look at Exodus 32. Oh my goodness, I get so excited. I'm gonna take a drink, I'm gonna slow down, I'm gonna say the right chapter and the right verse so we can all read the same spot. 
Exodus 32, 15. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain. Two tables of the testimony were in his hand. And the tables were written on both their sides, on one side and on the other were they written. Does that sound familiar? I mean, it's like we're right at Revelation chapter 5. And I saw a, a, a book in his hand written within on the inside and on the back side. <laughs> These things aren't in here just because. God doesn't waste any time. They were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses' anger waxed hot and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. So now he's been up. He's been up in the presence of God. And he's received the law of God. But if you read the previous chapters, brother, God is telling him all about temple worship and all about the, the law. He's giving them all kinds of information. But all that was written on the table of stones was the Ten Commandments. Because the Ten Commandments is the covenant between God and his people. He brought them to Sinai to marry them. The purpose of sending a prophet to go rescue them from bondage was to bring them out to Sinai so he could marry them, but they refused. The purpose of sending Paul, a prophet, was so that he could marry them, but they refused. So what's the purpose of sending this prophet in the end time? To bring us to the mountain so we can marry him. Let's not refuse him that speaketh from heaven. So now, you know, Moses brings them here. God wanted to give his word directly to his people. So he spoke. He come down with fire and he spoke. And when he come down with fire and he spoke, the people ran the other way because they could not endure that which was commanded. They couldn't take him in the voice direct from God. And they prayed for a prophet to come. And he says, that's fine. That's what you'll have from now on. And that's the way God's done it ever since. And so he brings him up into the mountain and he gives him all kinds of the word. But he writes on these two tables of stone the covenant between him and Israel. And he comes down with this covenant, this, this, these two tables of stone, written in stone between God and the people. And he found the people already in idolatry. And he was so angry that he cast out the tables of stone from his hand and they broke to pieces. Because when Paul would come with the revelation of the word, before they could unite, they already went into idolatry in the first church age and the word was fragmented. It's the same pattern over and over again. Now the word was broken, amen. The covenant between God and his people is broken and fragmented and people could pick up pieces and have a little bit of this and a church age could grab a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Armenianism and Calvinism and, and right? But God wasn't going to leave it that way. God was going to fix it his own way. Praise God. Let's turn to uh, Exodus 34 and read verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were the first tables which thou breakest. And be ready in the morning and come up in the morning unto the Mount Sinai and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount, neither let the flocks nor the herds feed before the mount. And he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up into Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. 
So now the word has been broken because of idolatry. And in idolatry, the word's been fragmented. But God now is going to give his people the covenant again. He's going to give the people his word again. And so he calls Moses back up into a mountain. But before, he tells Moses to cut two tables of stone out of the mountain. Amen. That means Moses was going to have to grab a sharp tool. He's going to have to take a sharp tool. And he's going to have to cut Amen, two tables of stone, but not right on the two tables of stone because Moses is going up to the mountain recognizing that there's word that's been broken. Amen, and he's coming up with two tables of stone with nothing written on the stone. (laughs) I love the word of God. Amen. How did he get these tables of stone? Oh, he must have just grabbed something from the air, a sharp tool or something, amen, and cut it out. And he realizes there's got to be writing on these two tables of stone. Amen. Brother Branham, he's in Sabino Canyon, amen, and he lifts up his hand, and all of a sudden something strikes his hand. And what is it? It's a sword. And it says, it's the sword of the king. He said, oh, a sword of a king. He said, no, the sword of the king. What is it? The word in the hand. The prophet gets a sharp tool, and with the sharp tool, he can cut cut the top off and say, there's something here in the same shape as this. There's something underneath. Moses cut something the same shape of what was lost the first time, but has nothing written on it. Unwritten word, unwritten stone. And Brother Benham takes a sharp tool and cuts the top off and in the same shape of the seven seals, in the same shape of the capstone, there's another stone with nothing written on it. So when Moses was gonna get the writing on the stone, he had to take this stone that he cut with a sharp tool and go up on the mountain. And up on the mountain, God would come down in a cloud. (laughs) Oh, praise be to God. Everything Brother Benham did was orchestrated by the word. This is what I was talking about the first time, early in the message tonight, this morning, when we said we've been taking the word and trying to mold Brother Ben's message inside our paradigm of the word, amen, and it's the actual revelation of the word that brings light to what's laying here in the message. How do we know what Moses is doing if it wasn't for what we've seen happen in this day and caught the revelation of what's happened, and it unlocks the mystery back in Exodus? Exodus is not unlocking the mystery today. The mystery today is unlocking the mystery in Exodus. We've got to catch the revelation by faith. We've got to catch the revelation of the word today. Amen. And if we catch the revelation of what's happening, your Bible will become a new book. But we've tried to take the old book of the old Bible, amen, and tried to take the message and stuff it into the old book of the old Bible. That's not a new Bible. That's not a new book, friends. But the seven seals loosed that book from the old form that we had it in so that it could pop wide open so that we could catch the fresh revelation from God. And that revelation will unlock the mystery of the whole word. We've had it backwards. How do we understand what Ruth was all about and her journey in Moab and coming back and and Orpha and two churches and false and because of the revelation today, unlock the mystery then. That was the white part of the stone that was hidden behind the words. Amen. How did we get the interpretation of the white part, the unwritten part? Where does the Bible say Ruth, amen, is a type of the Gentile bride? It doesn't. It's white. Amen. Where does it say Rachel, the fourth one to bring forth from Jacob, brings forth uh, Joseph, amen, a perfect type of Christ, and brings forth Benjamin when she departs, showing the ministry of the bride? Where is that? It's written there, but it's in the white part. What revealed the white part? When a prophet could pop the top off, when he could grab a sharp something from the air. Hallelujah. We've got to be spiritually tuned in. When Brother Branham says and serves this time, I grab something out of the air somewhere. And then he comes just a month later. Because the happening in Sabino Canyon with the sword in his hand happened just a month later in January. And he holds his hand up and something mysteriously strikes his hand. 
How can you tie those together? How can you not tie those together? You see, friends, it's not intellectual understanding. Amen. It's not the ability to do a word search and compare exact phrases. It's a revelation that unlocks the whole mystery. It's a revelation that unlocks the message, and it's a revelation that unlocks the whole Bible. And without that revelation, you'll be a frustrated human being because you'll always be trying to take firm, hard, fixed, unflexible words and explain and understand the message. When Brother Branham doesn't use the scriptures in an unbending, unflexible, stiff, rigid way. And if we try to use the scriptures in a way different than he used the scriptures, which he used them the same way Jesus Christ used the scriptures and the same way the apostle Paul used the scriptures, but if we try, amen, so that we're not deceived and so that we don't go in error and so that we don't make any mistakes, take a common, well-defined understanding of the Bible, do you see the foolishness of mankind? Do you see our own, our own failure? Do you see your failure? I see my failure. Take the rigidity of the word and a rigid interpretation of the word and try to understand the message with a rigid interpretation of the word and all we end up doing is getting confused. And we do word searches and find exact phrases and then we say, well, what did Brother Branham say about this subject? And you start searching through and it's like, oh, yeah, he means this and he said that he means this and then all of a sudden he switches. At the opening of the seventh seal, ah, seventh seal open. We know the seventh seal is not open yet. The seventh seal is not open yet. Because that's not the way to find truth. The way to find truth is a divine revelation from the Father himself who unlocks the mystery in your heart and then you have faith in what that prophet said and you let that be the measuring stick that unlocks the, me the, the whole Bible. You can't work backwards. You've got to work from the revelation at the top down. You can't work from the bottom up. Hallelujah. So Moses now takes a sharp tool. Where'd you read that, Brother Chad? It's between the lines. I don't think he used a dull tool to cut out the stone. Oh, once you catch the revelation of the word, the Bible's fun. All the rigidity, all the stiffness, all the fear of having it wrong just vanishes away. And all of a sudden, you realize that this word is my playground. This word is my land. This is the streams and the hills and the fields that he gave me to enjoy. This word is my Eden. And I can eat the fruit from it and I can go anywhere in it and I can enjoy being in Eden. And all of a sudden, the word gets fun. Because Moses must have took a sharp tool and cut out two tables of stone with nothing written on them and went to the mountain. Because Brother Branham had cut the top off to reveal a stone with nothing written on it. And he takes that stone up to the mountain. How do you know he took the stone up to the mountain? My goodness. There was no real stone. It was a dream. <laughs> he took that stone in his heart, the, the, the mystery that was there, he took it with him up to the mountain in Sabino Canyon, and then a cloud came down and revealed the name of the Lord. But then let's go over here to verse 27. Between verse 5 and 26, uh, God is speaking to Moses, giving him all kinds of instructions. Now, let's, let's back up and look over here at chapter 34, verse 1. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables, which thou breakest. So the Lord says, I'm going to write on these tables. You hew them out, you bring them up with nothing written on them, I'll write on them. Now, verse 27. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words I have made a covenant with thee 
and with Israel. And he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Who wrote upon it? Moses. Ah. It was Moses' hand, but it was the word of God. Moses became the tool, amen, that God was using to write it. Oh, it was Moses' hand, all right, with another sharp tool. Where did he get that sharp tool? I don't know. Maybe he grabbed it out of the air. He was up on the mountain. He went up on the mountain, and God said, I'm going to ride on these stones. He went up into the mountain uh, expecting God to ride on the stones. He had already cut the stones out. So maybe he just left all of his sharp tools. Because God said he's going to ride on this stone, so he goes with unwritten stone, amen, in the same shape. He knows it's got to be the same thing. <laughs> Because you can't add to or take away. It's got to be the same thing. But Moses can't write on there because Moses doesn't know what it is. Amen. So now he's got to go up and God says, I'll write on it. So where did he get the sharp instrument to write on it? Maybe he had his hands up rejoicing and maybe something struck his hand. And maybe he took that, amen, and was able to carve out of the stone what was unwritten before. And when he, when he carved it out, he realized it was an exact match to what was laying in the first word. Oh, praise be to God, friends. That hits me and thrills my heart. Why? Because it's the same story, a revolving history, doing the same things. If you know what's been, you know what will be. And all that is is what's been before. That's what Solomon told us. Amen. This has already happened. I mean, the, Brother Brennan's ministry has been vindicated by the word. Everything he did was based on what happened in the word. And now he was given this sword, amen, to cut, amen, out of the white stone and give us the revelation of the unspoken part of the word, which was the revelation contained in the seven thunders, which was the interpretation of the symbols of the seven seals that were given in symbol form, amen, but nobody knew what they meant and they probed at it and they poked at it, but the revelation was laying in the seven thunders which wasn't written down, which John heard but couldn't write, but Brother Branham picked it up and where did he get it? Brother Branham says, it's not a man, this didn't come from a man, it's been the angels of the Lord, amen. Brother Branham was the tool that God used to speak from the microphone, but he's not the one who can make up the words, it had to come directly as a revelation from God Almighty to interpret the unwritten stone that was under the cap. And so Brother Branham didn't reveal anything, amen, he was only the tool that God used to reveal it because Moses didn't write on those stones, God said I'll write on those stones, just like God said I'll go down and deliver my people, now Moses you come and go. I'll write on those tables of stone, now Moses pick up your pen and write. You see, friends, when we take the form and rigidity, amen, away from the word, the word gets super fun and exciting because you see it not as stories but as one story and an unfolding of the one mystery, the one plan, the one goal God had in his mind. What was that? Christ, the mystery of God revealed. Oh, praise God. I'm so far off my notes, I don't even know where I'm at. Amen. Brother Bam said, don't you say thank you to no man in the seventh seal. This didn't come from a man. He said, I knew not those things. He didn't get it through study. He got it by divine revelation. Guess what? You're not going to get it through study. Now, I firmly recommend reading your Bible every day. And I firmly recommend reading and listening to the message constantly. But without a divine revelation, you may catch some of the writing on the outside of the stone, but you'll never catch the writing on the inside. That comes by divine revelation. And that's the mystery that is unlocked in our hearts. Hallelujah.
Brother Bram goes back to Junior Jackson's dream. He says, and Junior turned around. This is 1964, questions and answers from August of 64. And Junior turned around and looked, and he seen me going towards the west, towards the setting of the sun, going over one mountain, another mountain, real fast, just getting. Then he turned around and looked and seen me gone. A whole big group of them took off that way, and they, they wanted to go this and do that after I told them to stay there, stay here, stay right here. This is the place. And then when I did that, I went just exactly, and a little bit after that, the angel of the Lord appeared to me. Go out to Arizona yonder. I heard that blast go off and went there. And what was it? The boy dreamed that dream just exactly right. And the Lord gave that right. Remember, I said, there's something I'm going there for. And when I went there, it was the mystery of the seven seals. That was sealed up on the inside of that mountain of the Lord. The mystery of the seven seals was sealed up on the inside of the mountain of the Lord. That mountain was the word. Had the word around it. It was the readable part, the writing on the outside of the book. But there was something on the inside of the book that light had never shined on before. And it was the mystery that was laying through the whole Bible. And it was sealed up with seven seals. And that was the revelation of the seven thunders would come forth and unlock what that mystery was. And here we are, recipients of the interpretation of the white stone. Brother Bram says in the Feast of Trumpets, immediately after that the angel of the Lord appeared and told about the seven, or the seven seals, that I was to return back to Jeffersonville and preach the seven seals. There if I've ever said anything that was inspired, it was in that. There where the angel of the Lord met us and the Bible became a new Bible. There it opened up and revealed all the things that the reformers and things had left out. It was the complete revelation of Jesus Christ. What is the book of Revelation? The revelation of Jesus Christ. What's the whole Bible? The revelation of Jesus Christ. What's the mystery of the seven seals? The complete revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and Jesus Christ is the revelation of the whole thing. And he's in me and I'm in him. <laughs> Do you understand? I'm, I'm in the white stone. Do you understand? I'm in the thunders. It was speaking about me. The, uh, the mystery, I'm part of the mystery. I mean, Christ is the mystery of God revealed. Christ is male and female. I'm part of the female expression of Christ, amen, which is the thought of God, anointed word for the day, amen. That's who we are. We are the white mystery that was hidden in the rock. That's what was revealed at the end time when he took that sharp tool, which was a tool to be, that he could use to, to, to cut the word and pop it off and show that there's more to this than what we've been reading. You know, Mo Moses brought the word, but then the apostle Paul, he went, you know, the apostle Paul had a rigid understanding of the Old Testament. And in his rigid understanding of the Old Testament, he called Jesus false, and everything his disciples taught heresy. Is that the truth? The apostle Paul, he was taught under Gamaliel. Brother Bram said one of the best schools, one of the best teachers in all the land. He had the best of best religious upbringing and teaching and he knew the word forward and backwards and in his rigid understanding, in his Bible school knowledge, in his Baptist Sunday school literature knowledge. I don't mean to be mean, but that's the truth. He had a rigid understanding. And in that rigid understanding, Jesus Christ couldn't be him because of this qualification and he didn't come and he didn't conquer and blah, 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 whatever reasons he had. They had their case. Don't you think the Pharisees didn't have points one through 10 on why Jesus could not be? Come on, they knew the word. Amen. Don't think the devil doesn't know the Bible. He knows the Bible. He's listened to all the tapes. He was there when they were preached the first time. 
but he doesn't know the mystery locked in my heart. He doesn't know the white stone inside my soul. He can't get there, amen. He can get to my mind, but he can't get down there. He doesn't know the mystery that's been unlocked. He doesn't know who I really am, and whether he believes it or not, I don't care because the seals have been broken in my heart. Hallelujah. And so Paul, in his rigid understanding, couldn't, Jesus couldn't be right, what he taught couldn't be right, and his disciples couldn't be right. But with one encounter with the pillar of fire, he caught a revelation from God himself and went to the desert of Arabia, and he said, I was not taught this by man, neither went I to Jerusalem, but I was taught by God himself. So where did Paul get the revelation? The same place Brother Branham got it, the same place Moses got it. And when he came back with the revelation, totally different than the way he saw it before, I knew not those things. When it came to me, it was totally different than the way I had it worked out before. Where did we hear that? And he came back. And he used the same Bible he used to reject Christ. Now he used the same Bible to teach Christ. He didn't need a new Bible. He needed the mystery of the Bible to be unlocked to him. And Christ is the mystery of God revealed. And Christ was the mystery through the whole Old Testament. Every prophet, the Psalms, the prophets were all speaking of him. And when Paul caught a vision of him and the mystery unlocked, he could go back to the same Bible and now go from synagogue to synagogue teaching Christ. Brother Branham, he said at the opening of the seven seals, my Bible became a new book to me. He made no edits or corrections to the written text. But it was altogether different than he had ever seen it worked out before. And for us, when we catch the revelation of this word, what's, what's the unwritten portion of the mystery locked in by seven mysterious thunders? When God opens that in our heart and we see the mystery, it's God becoming tangible. It's God becoming flesh. How? In the earth, stone by stone. See, there's a part of you that's from earth but there's a part of you that's in heaven. Then there's another part of you that's your soul that can span both heaven and earth. Is that true? I mean, I don't mean to say anything wrong, but you are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now. And now we are the living stones. You see the dirt, you see the rocks but back inside of there, there's a white rock. It's the unwritten portion of my life. Hey, man. And there's a mountain in the new heaven and the new earth that pushes out of the earth. A mountain that pushes out of the earth. Because part of you came out of the earth. But part of you was already there in heaven which is the heavenly city, New Jerusalem, that was here when Moses was here. Brother Bram said it was right over him the whole time. And you're there, and you're here. So part of the city, part of the kingdom, part of the mountain of God pushes up from the earth, and the rest of it comes down from heaven and sits over top until heaven and earth unite again permanently and forever. Where's that? White stone. Unwritten part. Brother Benham said in Feast of Trumpets, he said, this is the complete revelation of Jesus Christ. And the seven seals had the mystery hid of what it all was and is supposed to open it in the last day at the Laodicean age, at the end of time. Thanks be to God that finishes the message to the church, that finishes it. When, when they look back and see what has been and see where it's all brought up to, that finishes it, the age of the church. Is the church age finished? It's finished. 
at the opening of the seven seals. So let's go back to Daniel's prophecy. There's a mountain. Let's just call this mountain the word of God or the kingdom of God. You can call it either one. The kingdom of God, the word of God, God himself. And then you've got the image of Satan's kingdom coming by wisdom, coming by deception, coming by splendor and grandeur. Then you have a stone cut out of the mountain without hands that comes and smites the image in its feet. You have the word of God, the Bible. Christ is the revelation of God. Christ is the revelation of the Bible. Revelation 1.1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Or you could look at this stone as the book of Revelation, as the seven thunder mystery, as the seven thunders, as the message, as the book of Revelation. What is it? A stone at the top of the mountain. This is the mountain. The book of Revelation is the stone at the top of the mountain. Just bear with me. I'm just showing this as a type. And that stone, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which is the book of Revelation, came off of the mountain at the end time, at the days of these 10 kings, five west, five east, trying to mix, won't mix. One takes his shoe off and beats it on the desk so that you won't miss it. (laughs) So that you'll know that you're at the days of the 10 kings. Now it's time for the smiting stone to come smite. How's the smiting stone going to smite? What happens as soon as Khrushchev beats his shoe in October 1960, December 1960, Brother Branham starts into the book of Revelations with the revelation of the seven church ages. Why? Because there's coming a stone when he gets to those mysterious thunders. What stone? Maybe that cloud-shaped pyramid? The headstone, the capstone, the headship coming to the body, the fullness of the word, the fullness of the Holy Ghost, the full life coming where? Coming to unite with what? The mountain coming up out of the earth, amen, and the revelation coming down from heaven to unite once again, to cap it off, to show, amen, the full declaration of Christ in bride form. What is that stone? I'll tell you, for me, it's the book of Revelation. The prophet opened. It's the seven thunders. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ that has smashed denominational teaching, smashed the whore and the harlot teaching, smashed Jezebel religion. And then now, for me, I don't know about for you, but for me, it has crumbled denominationalism. It has destroyed carnal understanding. It has ripped apart, amen, the whore and harlot system, and it has blown it like the chaff of the wind. And out of that has grown a mountain. What mountain? The mountain of Jesus Christ. How? In the form of his bride. Amen. He's already been manifest in fullness in the form of Jesus Christ. Amen. But now at the end of the New Testament, it's time for a New Testament bride to rise in the full measure of the New Testament to display the fullness of Jesus Christ in feminine form. And that stone, which was the revelation of Jesus Christ, the seven thunders, the book of Revelation, the capstone, the headship, Call it whatever you want, whatever makes you feel good. It's all the same thing, coming down and smiting this religious system that has worked through the Gentiles from Babylon, actually from Cain, through Nimrod, all the way from Assyria to Babylon, through Egypt, all the way down through. And now, in the end time, by the revelation of the white stone, it has destroyed that, and we know the truth. And what is the truth? I don't need a religion. I don't need a priest. I don't need a man. I don't need a system. I don't need a book. I don't need somebody's interpretation. Why? Because I was with God before the foundation of the world. God is in me now, and I'm going back there, and it matters not. Amen. What happens? I'm a recipient of grace because my name was written on the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world, and I don't need your system to get me through. I don't need your arm to lean on. I don't need your crutch. Amen. Because I've already made it in the mind of God. Why? Because I am part of God and I am part of the expression of God. Amen. I'm one of the living stones that he is living in. The Shekinah glory of God is behind the dirt. 
There's a white stone in my soul that's a revelation of who I am, and I don't need a system of man. They've been blown and scattered. Out of that has grown a mountain of what? Of revelation. Growing, growing, more word, more word, more word, growing until it fills the whole earth. Sometimes we have such wrong understanding. If there's a mountain that fills the whole earth, everybody would know about it. Jesus was the light of the world. But the light of the world cannot cure willful blindness. A Pharisee standing this close to Jesus Christ, who was the light of the world, saw no light. And because he saw no light, didn't mean there was no light. And because you can't see a kingdom filling the earth, doesn't mean there's not a kingdom filling the earth. And because you can't see the light at the top of this when the headship's come down, a light arise and shine for thy light has come. Shalom, good morning. It is the rising of the sun. The world is in darkness and blackness. The moon's blacked out. The sun has turned to sackcloth. Where under the sixth seal, the earth is under judgment and completely blacked out, blind and cannot see. But that doesn't mean the light's not here because the light is here. Arise and shine for thy light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee, where? Upon the mountain that has filled the earth. The throne of God is at the top, shining the light through the whole world. And today there's a bright shining light. There's a kingdom of God upon this earth and it's a bright light that expels all darkness and all evil and it's the kingdom of God. And if you can't see it, it's not my fault. Because Jesus came as the light of the world and it wasn't his fault if somebody couldn't see it. But I'll tell you something, if you can see it, the gates of this city are open day and night. They never close. You're welcome to come into the provided place of worship. You're welcome to come into Christ. You're welcome to enter into this great revelation, this great mountain that has risen, amen, from the capstone coming and smiting the image of the beast. Now it has risen to a mountain with gates that stand wide open, and you're welcome to come. If you can see it, come, because the spirit and the bride say, come. The ministry of the bride is come unto this holy mountain. Come under the light of the age. Come under the light of Jehovah himself, the capstone, the headship at the top of the mountain, shining the light. You don't have to stay in darkness. You don't have to stay in the world. And you don't have to stay in Gentile religion. There is a kingdom on this earth filling the whole earth. And the gates stand open always. Now she has no need of natural light. No need of the sun, no need of the moon. Why? Because the lamb is the light thereof. And the lamb has come to unite the bride, and the lamb is the light thereof. She doesn't need your walled city. She doesn't need your defense and protection. The lamb is her protection. Her walled city is the word that she's part of. Praise be to God. Let's look at one more scripture together. Lots more, but we'll get to it some other time. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. (laughs) I will give him the hidden manna. What hidden manna? The manna that was behind the veil. The manna that was only reserved for the priest. So you better be a king or a priest to come in behind this veil. The veil that was reserved for a certain specific time. 
after the Feast of Atonement, the full word, because it's the word that bled for you, the word died for you. He's going to bring them to the true and living word, the true and living sacrifice, the word. And then the veil is going to be open. Brother Branham speaks in a couple places of a vision he had, and he wrote it in a book. I can't remember the name of the book, but anyways. In the vision he had years ago, there was a veil in the West. And out behind that, there was a mountain of the bread of life. Brother Graham talks about this and serves as this the time. He said there was a veil out to the West. He said there was a mountain of the bread of life. He said, Lord, that's revealed right before our face today. What was that great mountain? What's the bread of life? The word of God that we feed on. Christ is the bread of life. Christ is the manna that came down from heaven. And now he says, I will give you the hidden manna. And I will give him a white stone. Stone is a revelation. White, a pure revelation. A revelation that only comes from God. No light has shined on this yet. I'll give him a white stone. What's going to be in that white stone? A new name, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. See, Brother Chad, have you received a new name? You betcha. What is it? Does it sound Hebrew? Does it have a certain exotic ring to it? Yes. It's called Mrs. Jesus Christ. I received a white stone, and in that white stone was the revelation of my new name. I've always been part of him. I will always be part of him. I am part of Jesus Christ, and I'm here to display the part of Mrs. Jesus Christ. I hope you've received your white stone with a new name, but I've received my white stone with a new name. And because I received that stone, to me, it became a smiting stone that would smite all the intellectuals away. And I say, God be praised. Everything in Brother Branham's life was orchestrated and everything meant something. And Brother Branham comes now in 1964 to Sabino Canyon. He comes down and there's going to be judgment set in because they've rejected Christ. And there's a whirlwind that comes down three times and it claps three times and it rips the rocks out of the wall and casts them all about. It says judgment striking the West Coast and there the whirlwind went up and Alaska nearly sank. But I want to ask you, what did all those little rocks look like? They were all three-cornered rocks. Brother Brown said in a pyramid form. Like capstone rocks? Like revelation of the capstone, headship, the word? What is that? There was a headstone come down and blasted out of the rock, you and I. And now it's not one capstone. They're scattered all over. He said, what was that little pyramid? He said, the revelation of the oneness of God, the three are one, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. In that day, you'll know I'm in the Father, Father in me, I in you, you in me, making them all one. What is the revelation? I'm part of the capstone. I'm part of the pyramid. I'm part of the word. I'm part of the white mystery that was hid behind the print on this paper for thousands of years that I'm there. Amen. And he busted those stones and scattered them all over so you could pick one up and realize that I am a little stone in the image of the great headstone and I'm here to display the mystery. What is it? All that was in God, he poured into Christ. All that was in Christ, he poured in the church. I and you, you and me. Amen. All making them one. Amen. What is it? The revelation of the Godhead includes all the little stones. Includes you and I. How'd you get that, Brother Chad? Because I was given a white stone. (laughs) I was given a white stone. And at the right time, God would use a prophet with a sharp tool to rip the top off of my life and shine light on this stone and give me a revelation of what my name is. Because he would come in the first seal. Now that he's breaking the seals, now he's shining the light. He comes in the first seal and he says, now I'm no longer going to call you church. I'm going to call you bride so that you'll understand it. 
Because there's an understanding that can only come to bride, not to church. Because the church has been smashed, the denominational church, but now at the smashing of the smiting stone, now there's a revelation that's coming, and you can only understand if you get a new name. And now the prophet gave them a new name, gave us all a new name. I no longer call you church. I call you bride. Hallelujah. If you ever get a white stone and the prophet ever comes and peels the top off and shines the light on that white stone, you'll realize I'm part of God, an attribute of God. Mrs. Jesus Christ, an expression of Christ on earth. I can no more be lost than God can be lost. If you get that revelation, then just watch all the denominational systems start blowing like shafts in the wind and all the scare of the enemy and all the fear of a point system and making good points to please God and coming to church every time the doors are open so I can go to heaven and having to say I believe the message even when in my heart I have doubts about it. If you ever see the white stone interpreted to you, it'll blow all of that away. All of that chaff of that man-made denominational rubbish blows away. And all of a sudden, you've got the interpretation of your white stone. Because it's your new name. Personally, to you. Not because a preacher said it, not because mom and dad said it, not because Brother Branham said it in the first seal, but because God himself revealed my position to me and he gave me the stone and he revealed to me my new name in a pure revelation that comes from Father God himself. Praise God. Let's all stand. Musicians, if you could come. Hallelujah. God is good, friends. And I love him with my whole heart. I tell you, this revelation is more than anything to me. I'd rather have this revelation than have my next breath. I'd rather have this revelation than my next meal, job, home. It doesn't matter. I'd rather have this revelation. And if we catch this revelation, who cares if you lose your job tomorrow? Who cares if your house burns down the next day and all your friends tell you you're crazy? With this revelation, everything's going to be fine because all I got to do is portray Christ in whatever measure he wants for this little bitty space of time. And then I realize I've got a millennium. I've got a new heavens and new earth. I've got everything my heart's ever longed for is here and coming to me. Amen, and coming in greater manifestation. It doesn't matter anymore. Amen. Government rises, government falls. It matters not to me anymore. People complain, people leave, people come. It matters not anymore. Why? Because of the revelation of my name in the white stone. That's why it doesn't matter. Because my position is secure. My revelation is solid. I'm not going anywhere. Oh, it's the only thing that matters, friends. It's the only thing that matters. Praise God. Let's sing, brother. They were hopeless, beaten and so weary, slaves awaiting for the day of liberty. Just to see the glorious sunrise from the highest mountain top. And this dawn will see their shackles falling off. It's the rising of the sun. A new day has begun. Rays of mercy made us free from sin today. Oh, the joy that fills my soul. The message is my all. Thank you, Jesus, for this day of liberty. The grave is empty. He's risen. What a day. Because I live, you shall live as well, he said. Resurrected with Christ Jesus, lift your hands towards the sky. Your reward is to be ever at His side. It's the rising of the sun, 
I can feel the quickening power, amazing grace has rent the veil for us that day. grave open? Amen. Have you resurrected into his kingdom? Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Everything's fine. Amen. Worst day of your life, everything's fine. Amen. Why? Because I know where I came from. I know who I am. I know where I'm going. The mystery has been revealed to me. It wasn't good enough that it was revealed to Brother Branham. It's got to be revealed to me. And when it's revealed to me, something settles down on the inside. We can get worked up, that happens. We get worked up, we get bent out of shape. Things happen, stir us up. But there's something on the inside that calms us back down. It says, all is well, all is well. Let's just bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this day. God, we just wanna say how precious your word is to us. God, how thankful we are that in the days of those 10 kings, you sent a smiting stone to smite. And all the power of the enemy has been broken. And all the tricks and deception has been broken. God, and now we can go free. God, I just ask that you would just purge us now, Lord, and set us free from ourselves. Our old thinking, our old carnal understanding, give us the liberty to enjoy your word. And God, have preeminence among us. Display yourself through these vessels of clay. Take full control and have preeminence, Lord, in this place and among your people. For we love you, Lord, and we thank you, God. We ask in Jesus' name that you would go with us. You take us safely along the way and let us be a light in a dark and dismal world. Let us shine a true light. For the, the sun has risen and it's risen upon us and it's risen in our hearts. And let us shine it forth, Lord, that other weary travelers might find their way to this celestial city. For we love you, God, and we ask your blessing over us, your children, and all that we endeavor to do. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.